Nobody stuffs the world in that universe. So wrote Ontario poet, Toronto poet, Margaret Addison. She continues, the optic heart must venture. The heart that desires to see, to know, must go forth and look. I first read these lines as a teenager, and their perception gripped me. I never set out to memorize them, but they stayed, hovering somewhere up here alongside the imperative on the plaque that hung beside my bedroom door. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. If you're here tonight, it's likely that you're either compelled or at least intrigued by a rush of vision, that of bringing others into creation care, of the transformation of people and places by showing God's love of all creation. I would like to suggest tonight that to be a people of vision, we must exercise vision, attentiveness, engagement. If we are hoping to call others into a care for and of creation, our relationship with that creation needs must be more than a cognitive nod of assent, a heartfelt hurrah, or even digging into our pocketbooks. The best way to show God's love of all creation is to participate in that love. If we have not ventured with our optic hearts into tangible relationship with that creation ourselves, started to truly consider the lilies, even how they grow, then our vision and our efforts will be hindered, will be compromised. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an apologist. Of all things, as I said, I'm a literature scholar. But not of environmental literature, not even of Canadian literature. Scottish children's in Clean's literature, that's my forte. I'm not here tonight to teach you about Scottish authors, or perhaps more slightly more disappointing, not about Hobbits or Narnia. Sorry, guys. I am here as an amateur to share my passion, not just for God's creation generally, but for his creation locally, here in Ontario. Though, funnily enough, the Scottish authors Frodo, Aslan, Ents, Droyads, they are part of the reason I'm here tonight. Although we are in Hamilton, Luke has asked me to speak about my love for the Ottawa Valley. For the valley is the place that I know, and that I love deeply, and in which I currently dwell. I am increasingly aware that I do not know it deeply and well enough, and I'm working on that. My hope is that in speaking of the relationship that I have with a particular place in which I dwell, that you will be compelled to also pursue a deeper relationship with the place in which you dwell, to venture forth and see, consider and engage with, to know your place. I'm a farm girl. I've lived in some pretty big cities, and I've lived in five different countries, and I've visited, sometimes for months at a time, about a dozen others. But I'm a farm girl with deep roots in a place called the Ottawa Valley. For those of you not familiar with the valley, it's the rural region outside of Ottawa, defined, funnily enough, more by cultural boundaries than by those geographical, though the watershed of the Ottawa River does play a part. It was home to the Algonquin peoples before being largely settled by Scots, Irish, and French in the early 19th century, mostly. The valley has its own accent, its own cultural quirks and idioms, and a very strong sense of identity. It is not Toronto. That's part of its identity. <laughs> Luke and I have had long conversations about that when we were siblings together. My parents were not in the valley when I was born, but we returned there faithfully in the summers, sometimes in the autumns and sometimes at Christmas too, in the first years of my life. My parents, my father's a professor, even dragging urban university graduate students into the remote reaches of Red Fruit and Lanark counties to discuss literature, to practice hospitality, and to learn how to use their hands. The wonder of those students at what seemed to them the boondocks, the land of Grizzly Adams, undoubtedly caused a child that was me to see and appreciate my surrounds more than I might have done otherwise. Bringing guests into one's life often does that. 
When I was seven, my parents purchased the farm on which I was then on raised, and in which my siblings and I spent hours of both work and play. Knee deep in swampy creeks, chasing summer frogs and minnows, churning up the heady aroma of decaying leaves while slugging harm loads of bug riddled firewood through the bush. Breathing in the dewy pre dawn scent of a field early in the morning, whilst chasing jailbreak cows in gum boots and pajamas. So it's me in pajamas, not the cows. <laughs> Lying so quietly in a snowbank that we could hear the sound of snowflakes landing. Racing against the steadily encroaching wall of rain across the field, while stooping fresh bales of scratchy alfalfa as fast as our short arms could roll them. Hearing the clarion call of the first migrators in spring as we lugged sloshing jugs and buckets of sap across the field on a sled if we were lucky and there's still snow. Falling asleep to the impossibly loud chirrups of the spring peepers, newly emerged from the mud and frosty humans. Picking milkweeds, so many milkweeds in spring, in summer, in autumn, the milky stickiness coating our blackening hands as we pull up hundreds, thousands to keep the grain fields free. We got one cent for every ten. Wow. <laughs> Easy but rather daunting math. We wouldn't believe that one day people would be protecting and even planting milkweeds. But we did know intimately the caterpillars that would turn into beautiful butterflies and head south towards an imaginary place for Mexico. My father's people had been Scottish or Scots-Irish settlers in the valley, either straight from the old country or some amongst the first families who would, in what would become the Ottawa Gatineau area, UELs, United Empire Loyalists. My paternal grandmother is one of 12 children, so I have extended family everywhere up there. My roots are deep, but my resident alien mother had as much to do with the cultivation of my love of that place as my generation's long eternity. A metropolitan American, born of Swedish immigrant parents, my mother was a wonderful model, my city-born mother was a wonderful model of investing in one's new place. She instigated our maple syrup operation, which taught us to be attentive to temperature fluctuations, to listen to when the trees independently drip their sap, to wonder how the first genius intuited what would happen if it was boiled down. With her, we dug wild leeks for dinner and gathered bittersweet for decoration. With her, we learned from local old-timers how to make the sweetest and most delicately colored jelly out of wild grapes, crab apples, and saliva sappy choke cherries. With her, we learned about two-step berries that could kill you and touch-me-not that could heal you. We pressed wild, viol wild violets and sumac leaves for decorating candles and cards and bookmarks. We learned which wildflowers keep well in a vase and which can be dried as everlastings. We persisted against backache and nettled fingers with an enormous bench patch, the harvest necessary for winter fair. Looking back, I realized that I learned as much, if not more, from my immigrant mother about the land in which I dwelt than from the relatives with deep roots there. I had other teachers in books like The Incredible Journey, Glengarry School Days, Two Little Savages, Shantyman at Cash Lake, the movie Paddle to the Sea. These all gave me a deep sense of place, a place I recognized and to which I belonged, of which I was a part. Andy Green Gables, Moet's Lost in the Barrens, Emily Carr's Cleewick, those helped too, surreptitiously teaching me more about how to love Canada's ecology generally. But there was something particular about the resonances of those local books. They wove the stories into my tangible daily surroundings. I don't want to romanticize, and that's why I've noted that my siblings and I were outside because of the hard work we had to do, as well as for the play. But most of my neighbors, farmers, and others had similar love of and familiarity with the great outdoors. They too knew the creatures, the plants, the seasons, because that's also where they lived, for work, or play, or both. Through them, I learned that the more time you spend with your community, with people, animals, the land, the better you know it. 
And so, the more likely you are to notice changes. Just like if you notice if a friend got glasses or a haircut, so you notice the harbingers of one season ending and another beginning. The swallows starting to gather on the wires at the end of summer. The first red-winged blackbirds trilling in the barren marshes in early spring. You remember from one season to the next, it's much drier this summer. The berries are very sparse this autumn. The ice hasn't frozen over the river yet this year. I remember when we started noticing things that were more than typical variations. When the hedgerow apples were dirtier, blacker in the autumn. When the loon calling diminished dramatically over the lakes that night. When the bluebird and heron was plumbing. When the majestic elms that had once graced almost every field turned into haunting silhouettes in the middle. Because we knew the land, we noticed changes, both large and small. I was blessed. I knew where I was from, and I loved it. That didn't mean I wasn't keen to go elsewhere. I was. England, Italy, Kenya, they were all on my list. But Ontario was in my DNA. Even after all my immediate family moved away, it remained home. I went west for tertiary education, Edmonton, Alberta, then Calgary beside the Rockies, then Vancouver and the rainforests and the ocean. I was exposed to no shortage of environmental beauty on micro and macro scale. I hiked mountains and gorges. I rode horses through rivers and over plains. I swam in phosphorescence and harried anemones and tidal pools. I am sure I would have appreciated that beauty even had I never known the beauty of Ontario and the Ottawa Valley. <coughs> but I don't think I would have as thoroughly appreciated, say, the prairie crocus, had I not known that we didn't have them back here. Nor noticed the particularities of the mountain marmot, had I not known our groundhog. Been quite so startled to discover that a stream could swell from an avalanche miles away, had the avalanches in Ontario. The stellar jay, so similar and yet so different from the blue jay, it amused me greatly. I saw these because I had seen the others first here. I did find the familiar, the ubiquitous herb, or the, the ubiquitous, ubiquitous herb robbers. That's the same herb robbers. You'll find it everywhere. The sprightly spring azure butterflies. The impossibly smooth cedar wax wings. But I also missed many others. The jaunty bluebird males staking out their claim in the spring. They weren't out there. The fairy fireflies harking in the coming of another summer. The intensely blue skies after a night of howling snowstorm. And the autumn leaves. Always Ontario's rocks and trees and lakes. The familiar, the new, and the missing. All of these more evident, more visible, because of what I knew at home. Shortly after beginning grad studies at Regent, I came back to the valley in autumn. My first Ontario autumn since high school. That scent. The mulching leaves don't smell the same in Edmonton, Calgary, not even in Vancouver, where they do have some maples. Flying back west afterwards, up out of Ottawa, I looked down on the thousands and thousands of acres of autumnal color, and I was almost overwhelmed in realizing how much this place is part of who I am. Ever since that autumn pl flight, those who know and love me have known of the Ottawa Valley. By God's grace, 20 years on, and I'm back there again, putting down more roots in the land of my upbringing. My first summer home, I suddenly stopped my husband in the middle of a walk. That smell, I said, and I breathed deeply again. That smell is the smell of my childhood, of almost every summer of my life, and I only know it because I'm smelling it again. I had never noticed any particular smell growing up in the valley, but now that I smelled it again, I realized that it must be a certain combination of the plants and trees that grow in the valley at a certain point in the season, all culminating on that day. I'd never been in that specific field before, but I'd been with those plants and trees in those temperatures on that Canadian Shield soil. And that smell, it was good. 
Coming back was like returning to old friends. Bugs, critters, plants that I came to know as a child, I was seeing again. Blue spotted salamanders, dancers and dashers and darner dragonflies. The old Canada bird. There are new critters too that hadn't been there before. Coyotes had moved in, decimating the once overly abundant groundhog populations, and now sustaining on the newly returned turkeys. Also returned after almost a century gone are the vicious but fascinating fishers. And recently officially verified in our township, the cougar. On Wednesday, this Wednesday, I saw, and I've got a neighbor here, and so he doesn't know that I've seen this, um, for the first time ever that I've seen in Ontario, and probably up and down there, but I've never seen them up where we are, river otters. Galumping, galumping gloriously across the, our fields. We're about five kilometers from, from a lake. Right in front of me, along our soy field. It was pretty incredible. There's, there's river otters. And as for the new invasives, don't get me started on the prickly ash, that dastardly prickly ash, worse in our area than even the buckthorn. There are also now absences, species endangered or gone. The blooper will, the bobolink, and shockingly, as you guys all know, the once abundant milkweed loving monarch. I saw three this year on our property. Five years ago, I saw hundreds in the same fields. I was eager upon return to become reacquainted with all of this, to introduce my English husband to old friends, and to get to know that which I hadn't known before. And we have become that. But recently, carrying on with my academic work between gardening, farming, walks in the fields and woods, I was struck by an army. And this, for those of you who have been waiting, is the part related to August and Narnia. The guy on whom I wrote my PhD and the subject of the majority of my academic work is a 19th century scholar author named George MacDonald. One of the things I spent considerable time on is showing the ways in which MacDonald was such a major influence on the Inklings, both like Tolkien and Lewis. That he was is fairly widely acknowledged, but not a lot of time has been spent in looking at the ways in which this occurred. And one way was in MacDonald's persistent call to be attentive to the beauty of creation in both the large and the small, to know not only what a flower or mountain is made of, but to take time to marvel at what a flower or mountain is, to better understand the maker by attending to the works of his hands. As MacDonald was reminded, not only in the Psalms and Job, but throughout scripture. For MacDonald, this call to attentiveness was related to another recurrent theme one that resonated deeply with his own island culture. That our community includes all of God's creation, not just the humans. And that if we recognize God's hand in each of these species and in the land itself, and if we seek to bring him honor in how we relate with each, if we recognize our responsibility to attend to and care for our whole environmental community, we will discover that the long-term health and identity of the individual elements within that community are actually inseparable from each other. And I think we're seeing that more obviously in the 21st century than we have yet. MacDonald passed on the baton to Lewis and Tolkien. And in their work, and this in their work, this continued love of creation and recognition of humans and natural environment as being part of the same created community is pervasive. What reader of Tolkien has not looked at trees anew for encountering ants? Even if they don't notice how intentional Tolkien is in making his heroes either gardeners or woods craftsmen or both, and his villains destroyers of the land. What lover of Narnia has not been challenged by Remedy's claim that a ball of gas is only what a star is made of, not what star is, or been thrilled by Lucy's still listening the awakening whisper of the trees. Even if not struck by how crucial the integrated relationship of humans, animals, and even tree and water spirits are to the entire non-Armia construct, 
And by the fact that when the world of Narnia comes to an end in the last battle, its portent is the shuddering decimation of a forest being clear cut. C.S. Lewis's favorite of George MacDonald's novels, a tale of early 19th century Highlanders who ended up all over, of, of the type of 19th century um, Highlanders who ended up all over Ontario. This novel details some of these same Narnia and Middle Earth themes in realistic fiction. So if you're not into fantasy, you might want to consider this book called What's Mine's Mine. It could almost be a signature text for Russia. Simultaneously an exegesis of Isaiah's emphasis on the integrated relationship of people in the land, whilst a condemnation of the very Highland clerics that sent my ancestors and likely some of yours to Upper Canada. It contrasts romantic characters who think they love and know nature because they attend art galleries and they can recite worthy poems extolling the sublime elements of mountains and forests. They compare these people, construct and contrast these people, these characters, with characters who actually spend time out in those forests and on those mountains, who intimately know both the dangers and the glories, who know the scent of the wild rose comes with the sting of the image. The novel, which even accurately predicts the extirpation of specific wildlife species, McDonald anticipates prophetically that some of these species will be extirpated from Scotland. This novel ends with a Scottish clan cleared from their homeland, forced to leave the rivers, forests, fields, creatures they knew so well and have lived with for generations, to be replaced by the farm animals of wealthy landlords who will themselves spend no time on the land, for the clearances happen purely for economic gain. Landlords who pay no heed to the generations of land has been really just evicted, unaware that abrupt change in land management will indeed wipe out entire species, in addition to an ancient people's culture. An integrated environmental community that once spanned centuries, gone. And for those of you who don't know, this really did happen in Scotland. This Don writes the novel about it. But this is what happened with the Scottish clearances. At the novel's end, the exiles board a boat for Canada. The inherent tragic irony, of course, if you haven't put this together yourself already, a century and a half later, we are only now beginning to recognize how massive were the abrupt land management changes that occurred here as those displaced exiled Europeans themselves displaced deeply integrated indigenous communities, having dire effect on the species here, often incurring greater landscape changes here than had happened in Scotland. It's part of the narrative of the social history that we've forgotten generally. But back to MacDonald, in his repeated emphasis on integrated humanity, he, like Tolkien and Lewis after him, emphasizes repeatedly the importance of knowing names. I can tell when I showed those slides that some of you knew those, those birds, those creatures, not just by sight, but I can tell by the sound that you knew them by name. If you know the name of something or someone, then you see it. You eye know it. It is no longer an object. If you know the name, it becomes a subject. Once you know what a daisy is called, it's no longer just a flower. It's a daisy. And you see them, not only on the lawn, but if I say she wore a crown of daisies upon her head, you don't see generic flowers in your mind's eye, or even random red or purple flowers. I know you saw daisies. Knowing names also means that once something you've learned to see in your community disappears, you know that you no longer see it, like the moment butterfly. MacDonald, Lewis, Tolkien, in their storied explorations of these type of themes, they helped to strengthen my love of nature and creation generally. They helped me to have a more integrated grasp of my environmental community as a whole. And at first, if you knew my main work on these authors, this may seem some distance from that. My main work is exploring how these guys developed their understanding of an ability to create stories that can be transformative to the reader. That's what I work on most of the time. How do they create stories that transform the person who interests them? 
because they do. Their collective passion for knowing the stories of the past and how out of those stories their own stories are intentionally forged, that fascinates me. And in my research on this, I've discovered that all of these writers are direct beneficiaries of a man named A.J. Scott. I'm sure maybe three of you here, because you know me, have ever heard of A.J. Scott. But A.J. Scott was the first ever full-time English literature prof. So he's kind of like a patron saint for those of us who are lit people. Scott himself was an English immigrant. Uh, sorry, I didn't know you'd be horrified. I said that he was a Scottish immigrant. <laughs> Scottish immigrant. But to England. So we weren't taught in schools. And it was Scott's passion to reintroduce these people that led to the creation of English literature as a university di discipline. For Scott and his colleagues, this was a task of deep theological import. It wasn't just because he liked literature. Because they believed that the better people know the voices of their own history, the better they know and understand themselves. Thus, better enabling a healthy and honest relationship with God, and in their service to Him, and thus to others. Considering today's political climate, I think it's important to point out that for Scott and his colleagues, an element of this was their conviction that greater self-knowledge, both on the personal and community level, is an antidote rather than a contributor to nationalism. Scott chastises contemporaries for teaching and studying Greek and Roman literature, yet not their own. For being enraptured with continental tales, while not even bothering to learn the English equivalents. And I find Scott's arguments really compelling, really important. I can matter on for hours about the importance of knowing our own story, where we come from, the need for a multiplicity of voices to inform that. And I think Tolkien's manifestation of A.J. Scott's argument in The Lord of the Rings is compellingly holistic. Hobbits are heroes precisely because they are story keepers and true tree huggers. They're rooted gardeners. The character Aragorn is a formidable leader because he spent his life listening to and gathering old tales, as well as fine tuning in person his knowledge of plant life and forest lore. The defining difference between the characters Boromir and Faramir is that Faramir too learned the necessity to invest in these things, as he was mentored to by Gandalf. And Faramir's reward at the novel's end, I think most people miss this, his reward for his great service at the end of the Lord of the Rings is essentially the position of royal land warden. Middle Earth's first awash of staff. <laughs> Recently, when I was reflecting on Scott's legacy as passed down through Tolkien, McDonald, Lewis, on the importance of knowing one's own inheritance, of those who've gone before and now speak to us through what? the clouds of witnesses, if you will. In combination with attentiveness to one's whole environmental community, I was brought up short. I've been rabbiting on for years about Scott's impassioned plea for the English to know the literature and art of and about their own land. For the English to know the actual land rather than simply enjoying romanticized versions of it. I've rabbited on about how this legacy shaped MacDonald, Chesterton, Tolkien, Lewis, and countless others straight through up to the 21st century. I traced the rich resonances with one of the saints of ecologically minded Christians, Wendell Berry, that great caller to a sense of place. But suddenly I thought, how well do I, a student of Scott McDonald Inklings, how well do I know the stories told, the literature written in and about, the art of the land I am? I hope I've convinced you of just how deeply I do appreciate my home and native land, and that my familiarity with it, my love of it, is not a sofa-safe romanticized version. But what effort have I made to learn more about my whole environmental community from Canadian clouds of witnesses, let alone ones specifically of Ontario and the Valley? There is absolutely no question that I know British literature better than I know Canadian literature. <coughs> and if I'm not too bad on 20th and 19th century Canadian history, I certainly know anything prior to that in Britain a heck of a lot better. Just like those English people lectured to by Scott for knowing classical and continental Latin history better than their own. It's definitely true for me on the art front as well. If I am agreeing wholeheartedly with, nay, even promoting Scott's argument 
then I need to let it get a little closer to home. When I moved back to Canada after years abroad, I was aware of my Canadiana gap. And it's not like I knew nothing. I pulled off the shelf familiar Montgomery, Atwood, Lawrence, Kagawa, Emily Carr, Rudy Weed, W. Mitchell, Alistair McLeod. And I discovered Francis Antani, Louise Penny, David Adams Richards. But I hadn't read a lot of that literature in the mind frame of it better informing who I am and where I come from, let alone for better knowing that of which I am a part, the landscape, the flora, the fauna, etc., of this land in which I dwell. It's inextricably entwined natural and social history. I, who have written entire chapters on how George MacDonald's biblical theology mandates attentiveness to both social and natural history, how he's influenced both like Tolkien and Lewis to explore manifestations of an integrated, whole environmental community, I had listened little to the voices of others who had come before me here in Ontario. Sure, I can tell you my stories about bonding with milkweeds and shivering off maples. But what about the stories of the Canadians before me? I remember those ancient tomes on my shelf. At least some of you might recognize those titles. Backwards of Canada, roughing it in the bush. Always there in the background, yet never read. How many of you have heard of these two women, the authors of these two? Okay, those of you who have, do you know them? Raise your hands and get higher. So how many of you have heard of them? The okay, guys who know them, look at Look at how few of these people have actually heard of them. This has shocked me. How many of you have actually read their books? <laughs> yeah, raise your hand high because you deserve due acknowledgement. And we need you. We need you as teachers and introducers. I always knew their names. Well, from childhood I remember the names. But I have been absolutely blown away since coming home at how few of the Canadians I have asked have ever even heard of these women. Catherine Partrail and Susanna Moody were English sisters married to an adventuring Scottish military, married to Scottish military men, hoping to start fresh in what was then the wilds of southern Ontario, north of Peterborough. That's not far from here. The woman came from a family filled with writers, and so it was natural that they would pen their daily discoveries in this completely foreign world that they had chosen to make their new home. Published in 1836 and 1852, respectively, and instant bestsellers, internationally bestsellers, these two texts in particular, though both women wrote many more, these two texts became iconic titles on the shelf of Canadian classics albeit these days widely unread classics. I'm amazed now, looking back, that I learned nothing about these women or their writings growing up in Ontario. Two of Canada's first authors. Not in school, not in church, not in 4-H. Any of those would have been entirely appropriate. I think part of the issue when I was a kid was that they were women. That now should promote them. I think part of the issue now is probably because they're so explicit about their faith and their writing. Margaret Atwood put them back on my radar. Put them back on my radar. I read Alias Grace, the tale of a historic woman Atwood had met in the pages of Suzanne and Moody's backwards and or sorry, Suzanne's Moody's Ruffing and Bush. Atwood had done the A.J. Scott thing. She'd come across a character in another story from her past and decided to explore that other story and respond to that story with the story of her own. As Moody had introduced Grace's story to Margaret Atwood, so Atwood introduced Susanna and Catherine to me. The two sisters are incredibly different personalities, and their character colors, episodes, observations, and even theological responses in their books. I have now not only read, but have listened to them for hours via the incredible technology of LibriVox, lugging my poor laptop out into the scrub as I took on some of that nasty prickly ash with some clippers, able to see around me the very plants that these women are pontificating upon and balancing my computer against the cedar rail fence that was probably made the same year as these guys were writing their stories. And I was kind of blown away. 
Now, I assume that more of you would know about the feisty Susanna Moody through Atwood's journal on her. Um, and so I chose, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Catherine. Um, but clearly, you guys need to visit both women. Um, and hopefully, you'll be a little bit more interested in them after tonight. Catherine's a dream for the artist. Writer, botanist, artist, and amateur. Whatever category you fall into, you will find an amazing, compelling introduction to Ontario and to the community, the environmental community of Ontario in her work. In her work, I found intimate details that I'd never before noticed of trees and flowers that I pass every day. And as you may pick up, I like to notice trees and flowers. She saw me, she taught me, has been teaching me to see them even better, even more closely. She truly had a venturing optic heart. She took the charge of considering the lilies to heart, in addition to the promises of God's enduring care that surrounds that charge. In Catherine, you will find a comrade in the challenges of seeking good in the midst of great child, of great trial. That was one of her deep gifts. She would, I believe, be one of Arash's greatest fans. In 1852, Catherine wrote this. Man has altered the face of the soil here in Upper Canada. The mighty giants of the forest are gone, and the lowly shrub, the lovely flower, the ferns and moss that flourish beneath their shade have all departed with them. 1852, she was noticing this and worried about this. I'm amazed at the concern that she and her sister Susanna were already voicing more than 150 years ago at the impact that displaced Europeans like themselves were having upon their new home. Catherine, while raising multiple children, co-creating a homestead with her husband, farming, gardening, doing all the manual housework required at the time, which was significant, preparing stores for the winter. While doing all this, she wrote 22 books <laughs> and created numerous journals full of botanical specimens. Specimens that are today being re-examined by scientists wanting to better grasp changes in Ontario's botanical landscape. 150 years later, and she's still contributing to the science in our country. Her Canadian Wildflowers, written in 1868, or published in 1868, with its hand-painted, oh, yeah, its hand-painted illustrations by her niece, Agnes Fitzgibbon. The whole family were writers and as well as artists. And Catherine could paint quite beautifully, but these ones were painted by her niece, Agnes Fitzgibbon. And this book is one of Canada's first field guides. More specifically, it is a beautiful field guide for this region, for uh, not just Ontario, but for this part of Ontario, your home. 1868 field guide, still very relevant. Listening to the voice of Catherine has helped me to see in my own landscape the mystery that the inklings lend to theirs. She writes, could we but imagine Canada to have been the scene of fairy revels? We should declare that these graceful ferns were well suited to shade the elfin court of Oberon and Titian. She saw a middle earth here. And in Middle Earth is not quite your thing, try this description of a flower she found. I'm trying to decide whether I should tell you what flower it is or not, but it's, it's one of the types of lady slippers. The face is that of a monkey. Even the comical expression of the animal is preserved with such admirable fidelity as to draw a smile from everyone that sees the odd, restless looking visage, with its prominent round black eyes peering forth from under its covering. The botanist Perch likens the face of this flower to that of a sheep. I think that if a sheep sat for the picture, it must have been the most mischievous one in the flock. <laughs> Such an engaging teacher on the page, she must have been a delight in person. And she was intentional in teaching about her full environmental community. She writes to her sister back in England. My dear boy seems already to have a taste for flowers, which I shall encourage him as much as possible. It is a study that tends to refine and purify the mind, and can be made by simple steps, a ladder to heaven. 
as it were, by teaching a child to look with love and admiration to that bountiful God who created and made flowers so fair to adorn the fruit of the earth. Her environmental concern and love was completely inextricable from her family. I don't always agree with either Catherine or Susanna, and I occasionally side with one over the other and then vice versa. Moody, Susanna, has some particularly beautiful and even profound expressions of theology in her writing. And then sometimes, it's almost as appalling as her racism. She is evidently, or she is incidentally more prejudiced against the Irish than she is the indigenous peoples. But then her treasured friendships with some of those indigenous peoples and her acute observations, regardless of the lenses through which they're made, give me further insight into how those people once lived here before being moved off this land by my ancestors who'd been moved off of their land. Not only do Susanna and Catherine make me want to learn more from those indigenous voices, they actually give me an introductory access to them. Already I have learned via their recording of those indigenous voices some of the plant uses that most of, my, of the people in my current locale have forgotten. I have discovered how incredibly abundant our land is still. Some of what those impoverished and struggling 19th century immigrants learned from the indigenous people and then shared with their readers, like me still today, remains valuable information and value to us today as it was back then. I think this became particularly more clear to me this summer when I, t I took great delight because I was reading the movies, or well, Susanna and Trail, during the summer when I had a bunch of teenagers up helping me on the farm. And so I started quizzing them as to the names of weeds, weeds in our garden. See if they, could, if they knew that I didn't know any of them, but then to see if they could remember some of them each day. And bit by bit they get better at them. And then I pointed out as to them, as Moody and Trail had to me, how lamb's quarters, dandelion, portulaca, all those things I've been pulling out of the garden ever since I was seven years old, are all great in the salad. And how nettles are, yes, used in tea and soup, but also make for a fantastic substitute in Spanish pita. I don't think they had it in Spanish pita, but I've had it in Spanish pita, and it's wonderful. The teenagers, in my rural home, loved learning these things. And I loved giving them a try, which we would do at the table. And later, some of them were rightly disturbed when I sent them photos of a fancy restaurant salad in Vancouver that contained these items. They thought it was very cool that this salad in Vancouver had portulaca and lamb's quarters in it dandelions. You can even buy dandelions in the grocery store in Vancouver. But they thought it so wrong that it was only happening in an exclusive restaurant and at significant cost. While so many of our countries disadvantaged could be harvesting those same things for free. This really disturbed the teams who look around me. Inspired by Susanna and Catherine, these 21st century teens talked about how we should better know our own plants, mushrooms, and wild berries. Important natural and social lore that we could and should, they felt, be sharing with the poor and the newcomers to our community. So many intertwined layers, yes? Community voices that we've forgotten, which could be informing our sense of history, our land stewardship, our art and literature, our science, and how we better could care for our new or struggling members in our community, voices that across 150 years offer introduction to the community of flora and fauna in our own contemporary backyard. These sisters are just two of many such voices in whom I want to invest and to whom I want to introduce others to give us all a better understanding of the identity of our place in our community, to history both social and natural. I'm going to let this next voice speak for himself. Another such witness, a more contemporary member of this Ontario community, Bill Mason, artist, filmmaker, internationally recognized canoeist. 
His is a voice I did know in my childhood, most particularly through his film Paddle to the Sea, but also because of his works with Chambay Canoe and Water Walker. When I returned to Water Walker recently, I was incredibly struck by just how contemporary Mason's voice is. Though the quality of the clip I'm about to show you will dissuade you that it's anything other than the 80s, 1983 to be exact. Mason is really, I suppose, the closest thing I can think of to an Ontario Wendelberry. Uh, my limited technology skills make the links in this five minute of film jumpy. It's going to be a couple slides. I'm still amazed that I was struck by how amazing it is that the scene that young man was covered with the entire soundtrack. And as of three years ago, it is available to watch for free on the NFB website. There and, there. and Mason's engagement with Indigenous voices and his own reflections, I think, are uh, quite compelling, quite striking. And I'll be interested to hear if anyone has any other ideas, but I really think he is the closest thing we have to a one of the very ones today here in Ontario. So I hope that I hope that we'll be getting more voices of our own. As a member of your community, go me on. I'm new in this journey. I told you that I'm an amateur, only just becoming acquainted with the historic voices in my community that will help me know more deeply this native land, this Canadian environment, of which I choose to be an active, life-affirming part. I believe quite strongly in Arash's vision. I am immensely proud in how they are pursuing it around the globe. Their projects in Kenya, Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean, in Portugal, urban London, are exciting and compelling. Our Russia people are loving well, acting effectively, invoking hope. I've spent several time at the center in BC, seeing the partnering with schools and science and nutrition education, the equipping of new immigrants and refugees, the restoration of wetlands, and more. I'm so thankful, thankful that they are now here in Ontario. And yet my goal tonight is not to convince you to donate money to Arusha, though that'd be brilliant, nor even to donate time, which would perhaps be better. My goal is to convince you to get to better know the place in which you dwell. To come to know, perhaps even fall in love with the natural environment that is there. To learn to be attentive, or perhaps more attentive, and to draw others into that, be it urban environment or rural environment. Do you know the names of the plants in your lawn or the local park? It's unlikely that it's all grass like this. There's probably many kinds of grass. The beautiful speedwell is probably hiding there. It's hiding in lawns and parks around the world. One of my favorite flowers. The notorious scarlet pimpernel, it'll be there too. The miraculously medicinal plantain, especially helpful if you get a cut or a sting while you're outside. A myriad of clovers. So much more in your lawn in the park down the road. That flower in the cranny wall, poking through the cement on the sidewalk, first, learn to see it. Then, learn to name it. Then, learn about it and tell others. If you have a veg patch or a flower garden, do you also know the names of your weeds? Perhaps you'll discover, like I have, what once was more widely known that a number of them are highly beneficial, not only healthy for you, but perhaps able even to be used to protect and benefit those things you planted. That bird that just flew by, is it a bird? Or is it a barn swallow? A field swallow? A tree swallow? One of the 35 different kinds of sparrows that we have here in Ontario. That dragonfly, 
is a rugged local. It's larvae buried down in the frozen muck with fro wood frogs and toads and salamanders waiting out the winter. Or is it one of those that, like the monarch and the ruby-throated hummingbird, is a Latino migrant without whom our summers would lack considerable color? And if you feel like you've already got a solid handle on that, how familiar are you with the expressions and engagements of other Canadians, Ontarians, back through the ages in literature, art, music? Have you been attending to, seeking to learn from what others have to say about your home and native land? <coughs> if you do know the voices of Ontario's plant witnesses that come be have come before us, ones that you're keen to introduce the rest of us to, we'd love for you to do something for us tonight. During the coffee break or afterwards, at the back of the room, there's a place where you can write down the names or titles. Names like Moody and Trail, or Belinda, <coughs> Brooke, Jameson, Seaton, Terpstra. Names that you can share with the rest of us. Um, artists, musicians, writers, Ontario voices that you think contribute to our collectively understanding our full environmental community <coughs> and how to dwell here better well. Please share those names with us. And I think there'll probably be a place you can access those names on the site later on. And if you're good at going outside, if you already know what blue-eyed grass is, or how to listen for scarlet tanagers, that's a hard time saying the name, please grab the hand of someone who's more comfortable in front of a screen or at a desk. Take them outside. Belonging to a family of full of academics, I am all too aware of the academic's propensity to accrue intellectual knowledge, <coughs> but not know how to step out of the pages into the uncomfortable actuality, or even how to make time to do that. I'm going to tell you one last story, and it's about one of the academic ventures that I'm involved with in a new endeavor called the Lamathan Project. Our first year, during our conference on the history and spirituality of reading, one of the sessions involved going for a walk on our property, led by Luke Wilson and a young woman named Martin Karen. And there's a few people here tonight that were actually on that walk. Together they discussed not only the ancient Christian tradition of recognizing the book of nature as God's other communication to us paired with the book of scripture, but Luke and Margie asked people to pay attention to that creation whilst they were out there. They identified different wildflowers, invasive species, dragonflies, etc. Together they spent time reading God's other book. The follow-up comments and the evaluations after the conference made it very clear that the walk was one of the highlights of the conference for many of the attendees. We were amazed at how many of them were completely unused to going out for a walk in the country. Indeed, some scared or unsure as to how to do so. And some came back overwhelmed at how many beautiful things they had seen. This, despite the fact that the walk was occurring in the midst of a very buggy, humid heat wave. And as a result, we have determined to have an Arasha-ish element at our conference every year. All the more so determined after the responses to our first endeavor. And so this past summer, when we held a retreat rather than a conference, a retreat specifically for academics and practitioners in the field of theology and the arts. We very naively assumed that as the attendees were artsy, fartsy, Christian academics of a certain vein, that the centrality of this outdoor session to the rest of the retreat would be self-evident. It was not. Obviously, a number of folk considered it just a walk, an optional, unimportant form of light entertainment. And even though Margie had prepared more for it than she had the year previously, much of what she intended to teach fell by the wayside in the face of scant participation. People didn't show up, people dropped out. The weather was way more walk friendly than the year before. The scheduling was much better designed. The guide was more familiar with that specific place than she had been before. And we're not unique. Well, could have been a problem. But because we had assumed that these Arasha-friendly Christian academics would understand the import of actual engagement in creation, especially when in the midst of discussions on the relationship between God's creativity and our own, we had not spelled it out. 
Only afterwards did we realize how many of those artists and professors will happy to wax eloquent on Gerard Manley Hopkins, Emily Carr, Emily Dickinson, Wendell Berry, or actually rather uncomfortable out physically engaging with those dabbling things in God's dream for the world. Though certainly adamant that others do so, they were actually uncomfortable doing so themselves. As a result, we are all the more determined to keep this a rush walk an integral part of the Lone Latham Project, both in the conference years and the retreat years, and we are determined to get better at explaining its import. And yet, for all the lack of participation in that walk, those who did fully participate, they loved it. A number commented repeatedly afterwards on how they'd been charged to go out and find one wildflower that was new to them and learn its name. And I personally was struck at how, not just delighted, but how proud those people were at knowing the name of something that they hadn't known before. The rest of the retreat was peppered with, oh look, there's a St. John's wort. There's butter and eggs. There's some more yarrow. All those plants had been there before. That time of year, our house and barns are surrounded by these things. But these people had not seen them before the walk because they did not then know their names. Knowing the names, like Scott and Donald Tolkien have taught us, was helping them to cultivate attentiveness to their own surroundings, their own community. I know that if next year, when those people return, some odd disease has wiped out all those plants, they will notice. Had they not gone on the walk, had Margie not challenged them to be attentive even to just one plant, they not even notice if all those plants were entirely absent. But then, of course, they wouldn't have cared. Why are we not as passionate about our own endangered species as we are about these ones? These are beautiful animals who need our care and concern, as do these places. But so, too, do these. These Ontario species. I wish I had more slides to show you, but I can spend, unfortunately, very long time showing you pictures of endangered Ontario species. And this is the one that I'm personally most excited about. So if you don't know about the American eel, ask me about it later. This guy was born in the Sargasso Sea. He will die, or she will die, in the Sargasso Sea, but spend its entire life here in Ontario, in Lake Ontario, in the watersheds around Hamilton and Burlington and Waterdown, up in the Ottawa Valley. These creatures travel that far and spend 20 to 30 years here. But their numbers have plummeted so in the last 30 years by approximately 9%. I'll dare to argue that if we knew our Ontario species, their name, and how they grow. We would be as impassioned as people are about the tiger, the elephant, the blue whale. Because if we recognize them as part of our community, part of the identity that makes us who we are, with whom our community and voices have engaged for centuries, contributing to who we are today, be we immigrants old or new, then to lose these species would mean to lose a part of ourselves, our collective community, a collective community voice, our identity. Imagine an Ontario with no blue jays or bluebirds, no herons or loons, no deer or beaver, no birch trees. Top of all that, an Ontario with no maple trees. It wouldn't be Ontario, would it? The world just as a body has many parts. But all its many parts form one body. In caring for creation in Ontario, we care by extension for creation in Kenya, China, Portugal. We are called to steward all the earth well. But if we are not interested in the disappearing birds in our own backyard, or in the loss of rich arable land in the town down the road, or in teaching our new neighbors how to grow and harvest food particular to the land of their new community, then something is wrong. We need to seek out and encourage Ontario and the a new generation of Bill Masons and Catherine Hart Trails, 
to help us see and hear, and to go forth and smell, taste, touch, four or even five senses, as that lady really said, and share. Our doing then will be much better than before. I told you that my own goal tonight is not to convince you to donate money or even time to Russia, but rather to convince you to get to better know the place in which you dwell. To come to know so well the natural environment that is there, perhaps here in Hamilton, that you can start introducing it to others. To listen, if you do not already, to other voices throughout the social history of what is now called Ontario, as they recount their observations of and responses to its natural history, and to share those voices. But when the Berry is the Kentucky, came to Ontario. I have been fortunate to know very good people over the years, and I'm not planning on ditching those friends in England, Scotland, or Middle Earth. But I am now convinced that I need to hold company with my own Ontario community as well, to invest in the place God has seen fit for me to live at this point in time in my life. For me, that means I should know the historic voices of my own particular place better, understand the history of land, of the land and its inhabitants, human relations with them, and apply that knowledge to my opinions, my actions, my practices today. And in doing so, I will be investing more deeply in the plants and critters that I already have had the gift of meeting. I will be better equipped to both enjoy and serve my full environment to community, as I believe my faith compels. For each of you, the challenge to live well where you are planted will manifest itself in different ways. You too may need to start keeping company with overlooked historic and contemporary voices. Or you may need to start seeing when you step outside your front door. To learn the names of what you see. To not rush by, but to stop and consider how they grow. Be forewarned, such attentiveness to the land in which you dwell may lead to your falling in love with junk oats or hepatica, maybe even American eels. It may lead to you nattering to your neighbor about Catherine Parr Trail, Bill Mason, A.Y. Jackson. You may just end up learning dragonfly names with Luke or fighting Buckthorn with Paul. Regardless, you will come to better know your native land. And possibly then, even yourself. Transformation is always a risk when the heart endures to venture. <laughs>